Hello, gorgeous. Welcome to HG Radio, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration. Here is your co-founder and host, Kim Becker. Hello, gorgeous. You are listening to Hello, Gorgeous, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration on Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and soul. I'm your host, Kim Becker, once a hairdresser and a salon owner, now the founder of a nonprofit organization that coaches and trains women with cancer to help them smile when they look in the mirror. And if you ask me, I will tell you, I have the best job in the whole world. This episode is brought to you by Amplified Marketing Group. They specialize in affordable mobile solutions that will get you noticed and help you retain customers. Check them out at www.amplified.marketing. Our guest today is Kent Rader. Known as the world's cleanest comedian and speaker, Kent helps people in association learn and experience how laughter matters in reducing stress and building quality organizations. Kent graduated from William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri with a BS in accounting. He survived five years in public accounting and 12 years as a CFO and CEO of hospitals before becoming a professional speaker in 1997. Kent has authored the stress reduction book titled Let It Go, Just Let It Go, and co-stars with Jan McGinnis in the Baby Boomer Comedy Show. Clean comedy for people born before seatbelts, safety helmets, and Facebook. He has been heard on NPR's Talk of the Nation, Sirius Satellite Radio, and Kent is the winner of the Branson Comedy Festival. He has been seen on Comcast Comedy Show, Who's Laughing Now?, and his clean stand-up comedy DVD CD titled Kent Raider, The Grand Wizard of Comedy, was released on August 11, 2014. You may also hear his daily podcast called Laughter Matters on your Amazon Echo, Google Home, iTunes, or Spotify. Hi, Kent, and welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Kim. It's good to talk to you. Oh, my gosh. It's good to talk to you, too. You know, and I'm so excited when I get to have a guest on my show that I've actually met in person. Like, that's my favorite. (laughs) So I love it. I love that I've had the opportunity to sit and have dinner with you, and that just makes this interview that much more special. It does. It does. I agree with you. I was trying to think we met. It was at a show before a show in Michigan, wasn't it? Or it was. Yep. Yeah, you and Jan were actually. So I met Jan several, gosh, seven or eight years ago in Milwaukee, and then you guys were coming to Three Oaks, Michigan, which was about forty-five that's minutes right. from where I live. And so she reached out to me and she's like, hey, how close is this? And so I remember, (laughs) you know what I remember is we went for dinner before and then Michael and I had the opportunity to see the show, which was great. And then we wanted dessert after and remember that distillery that was next door only served alcohol. (laughs) Only served alcohol, that's right. (laughs) We couldn't get this as bad as we wanted dessert. We couldn't get dessert, but but the company was awesome. And so again, I'm so, so grateful that I had the opportunity to meet you and meet you in person, so. Well, it's it's great to talk to you again, Kim. Awesome. All right, so let's tell the listeners, I because I'm curious. I don't know that I know the story either, but how did you go from accounting to comedy? <laughs> well, I like I tell people I I wasn't a very good accountant, so it was it was easy. <laughs> I uh, I actually started uh, teaching people how to. I was working in in uh, uh, home care accounting, and they were needing to know how to read a financial statement, how to do a budget, and how double entry accounting worked. And I started teaching these classes all over the country for accounting, for uh, home care associations on accounting. And it was so dry. I started telling stories and um, I came home one night and told my wife, I, I had become a partner. I was going to become a partner in, in this accounting firm. And I said, I don't want it. I want to be a speaker. And she said, then do it. And so I started speaking on humor and stress and and that's kind of the origins of it. And then I wanted to get funnier, so I I started doing stand up in uh, in comedy clubs on open mic night originally, and thought that's all. My only idea was I'll do it until I learn how to perform and write better. And as Jan will tell you, it takes you ten years to <laughs> figure out how to do that. And by that time, you're headlining. And then Jan and I were starting to do theater shows as well. So it's been a it's been a strange a strange trip, if you if you might say. Now, how did you, because I don't know that I know that, or at least I don't remember, how did you and Jan actually connect? I love the whole thing of Baby Boomer. I sat in the audience when I watched you guys and cracked up laughing because all the things from back right. Baby Boomer-ish, they are hilarious. But I don't know, how did you guys meet and how did you come up with the Baby Boomer comedy show? We had a we had a mutual friend, Frank King, uh, who um, had knew that Jan was doing a lot of speaking and 
had done stand up but didn't want to do any clubs and I was doing a lot of speaking and he just happened to connect the two of us and we were talking one day about trying to do a theater show because we both enjoyed we both enjoy the speaking but we also just love doing pure stand up and but Jan did not want to go back into the clubs and I don't I do five or six weeks mostly working on new material a year and we because we worked clean we knew that we could go into theaters and we would get people that are our age and what what hit us was instead of describing uh, Jan or me because we're not famous we uh, we described our audience we said we wanted baby boomers to come to our our show because that's that's what our material is about and so it just it just kind of clicked and and the fact that it's clean we, we end up doing very well in theaters as well that's awesome and so what happened to you i know she and i have chatted a couple of different times and so like the whole pandemic thing like how has that affected your business <laughs> <laughs> i know that's a funny question in itself but, um, uh, but how how has that affected i mean i like i like i said i had a chance to chat with her and I, I didn't think about that. There are so many people that made their living going to these big conferences and speaking on stages right. and, and all of that was shut down. So how, how has that affected you and what did you do to pivot? Well, we, what, what, what did it, we were doing fine until March and then mid March, it just shut off and, and they pretty much rescheduled everything to the fall. And of course it hasn't, hasn't gotten any better. So they rescheduled everything to 2021 and 2022. And so, I have done a few, probably like Jan, have done four or five virtual keynotes, uh, which are okay. They're they're hard to do. you can't hear anybody, so you can't hear anybody laugh. So it's it's like being in front of a bad audience. It's like you know being in front of an audience that isn't laughing. So you're having to try to to do timing and give them time to laugh, but you don't know if they are or not. So it's uh, those are really those are really tough on comedians. I'm sure they're tough on everybody, but I've done four or five. Um, we, my wife and I are, uh, are in a really good place financially, so I didn't have to work. Um, but what we have done, both of our children have landed in Cincinnati. Uh, our grown, we live in Kansas City now, and uh, both of our grown children are in Cincinnati. So we have uh, sold our house and uh, are moving to Cincinnati. We own the house in Cincinnati as well. So we're basically downsizing and selling our house and moving. And that's, that's kind of how, how we have survived it. But uh, it's, it's, we've had less problems financially than we have, than I have had just maintaining my own sanity, just trying to, you know, I haven't, it's been 22 years. I haven't been home for longer than a couple of weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. And now I've been home for eight months and it's, it's like, Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> and and I, I think, I'm used and to, it's, and it feeds you too, right? The energy it of the does. audience and, you know, just knowing that you've got these, you know, these shows lined up. And I think all of that kind of, it feeds you and it builds you up. And I think that that's what people don't realize. It's not just the right. cancellation of the show. It's, it's all of that, that it's like, if you don't, if you have a muscle and then you don't use that muscle, it starts to deteriorate a little bit. Do you agree? It, it does. Exactly. And and I'm one of these people that if I have a week off, I go to the comedy club two nights, two yeah. or three nights and just do a set just because you feel rusty if you don't, if you're off 10 days and now. Um, but it, it it has been good for me in the fact that my I've, I've always been really disciplined about writing, but I've become even more disciplined um, and have a lot of things that I will have ready to go, I guess, once we go back. Um, my process is I go to the comedy club, I work on the new material and rewrite it and rewrite it until I feel comfortable with it. And then I start doing it in my speaking engagements and my and our theater shows. And I haven't had that luxury. I mean, I've tried new things on these virtual calls, but it's just the first time out of my mouth. And it's, it's just, it's an odd, an odd scenario for me. So, yeah, but we'll be, we'll be fine. We, um, we are, I feel like it's been good for me in the fact that to not have this, because, and to not have the ability to be in front of an audience, because it really does show me, I'm okay without it personally. I mean, it, it, you know, but I, I have a real need for bringing joy to people as I'm, as I know you do mm -hmm. and you have, and, and you can't do that at this point. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's kind of put your passion on hold, but 
that's allowed me to do other things as well. So we'll be fine. <laughs> but you know, I think, and and I know for me, like we've had, we've pivoted. We're we're in the process of pivoting even more because I, you know, when the salon shut down, obviously we couldn't do the makeovers either. Um, and so not knowing, you know, we've got an, a date to kind of start things back up again, but I'm not sure just with the, you're dealing with a woman with a compromised immune system. And so, exactly. so we've had to pivot, but, but by the same token, I'm so grateful for so many ways, because I know that when everything starts to go again, my appreciation for the little things is going to be so much greater than what it ever was before, because there are things Mine that I used to take for granted that I won't anymore. Right. And I hope I maintain that. Yeah, me too. Uh, I get. I get tired of traveling and I will grumble about <laughs> having to be gone or being in a hotel. And I hope I, I hope I remember what this has been like and, uh, and be appreciative of what I have. So. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. So you, we talk a little bit, you know, in the past about like you speak on humor and stress and, you know, cancer played a role in directing you on that course. Tell me a little bit about how that actually went, that, that directed you. It, it did. We, um, I, have, I was always, my, my wife and I have been married for uh, 38 years now, and I was always really close with her mother. Uh, and I, when I met her mom, we just instantly bonded, and we had a shared love for Twyla, obviously. But we, I love making her laugh, and you always knew you could count on her. I, 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 I was running one day, and um, some kids in, in Tulsa one day, and some kids yelled at me, and, and I, I have a standard response and that is basically to flip them off and and they, <laughs> they stopped and we were standing there yelling and this policeman pulls up and he, he's yelling at us saying you know break it up and move it along and I said something stupid like you know you heard him girls the man said move along and the policeman got mad and, and said he was going to put me in jail so I was telling father and her mom this and father said don't call me to bail you out of jail and I go I hadn't planned on that I was going to call your mom and Emily <laughs> said uh, I'd do it too just to hear the story <laughs> so, I mean we just we just had a great relationship and uh, she uh, at the age of 62 uh, she was the quintessential took care of everybody around her except herself she never took care of herself and she had, and we lost her at the age of 64 to colon cancer which is way too young yes. to, to lose her and Seeing, not just losing her, I'm sorry, uh, not just losing her was difficult, but it really showed me life is really, really short. Mm -hmm. And I had been doing accounting for 17 years at that point, and I hated it. And it really said to me, you can't find something you love, find your passion, and go to work on it and get out of accounting. And within it. Within a little over a year, I was I was doing this, and so well, it was her her yeah. example that really helped. But also, though, too, she loved your stories, and so by she you being <laughs> able to share the stories with audiences across the country, yeah. you know, I'm sure she's smiling too because now not only Twyla's mom gets to hear those stories, everybody gets to hear those stories. That's awesome, right? Well, and and we, uh, I I often think about. Um, when I first started, I remember thinking, I, I hope she does hear this. You know, I hope she hears that laughter. And and uh, you eventually this becomes a job like any other job. But I have ne there are times that I, I'll say something that's that's off the cuff, and I'll think, oh, my gosh, how much Trotter's mom would have enjoyed that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. We well, you know, and so cancer is obviously the diagnosis is stressful. It can be stressful on the person going through the cancer. It's stressful on the family, you know, that's having to watch the loved one endure everything, whether it's the treatment or, or whatever they have. And so how is humor a proven tool to reduce stress? Because I, I think that that's what we all need more in our lives, especially in today's day and age, is more right. humor. But how is that proven to reduce well, stress? They've done, they've done a lot of studies on, on humor. Uh, the, probably the original one. Uh, was done by a guy named Norman Cousins who wrote a book called Anatomy of an Illness, and he was stricken with a serious illness in the 60s and didn't wasn't happy with health care in New York City, uh, the hospital. So he checked out of the hospital and started watching. He, he started taking vitamins and herbs, but he also began watching March Brothers movies, and Alan Funt, who was on Candid Camera, was a 